16 to 1, a podcast about education, teaching, and learning. Hello. Hey. Hi. How, How you are doing? You? I'm good. I, I'm good too. Good. Um, who are we? I'm Katie. I'm Chelsea. And this is 16 to 1 Podcast. Yeah. We talk about education and learning and stuff. And, and stuff. All nice. Various, like and my sundry, softwares. <laughs> various and sundry items of learning. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, what are we drinking this week? I'm drinking a cold pop. I'm all jittery for my coffee today, so I'm drinking water. I'm getting ready for playing D&D tonight. So I'm preparing I'm... for a course light. Oh, yeah. We're preparing our bodies for consuming alcohol during D&D. Preparing. It's, it's the best way to experience Dungeons & Dragons is slightly inebriated, mm. but not too inebriated because you don't want to make a mess of things. That's true for you. Yes. True for everyone. <laughs> Come Thanks. on now. Sorry, sorry. No, it's all right. So what's new in the world? What, what's been going on? Um, you want the good or the bad? All of it. Just let me know. They on. have a new picture of Nessie. Of Nessie? The Loch Ness Monster. There's Did you new, see that? There's a new Nessie spotting? <laughs> well, it, someone took a picture of what they think is also it. But now it just looks like a big catfish. A big catfish? Unless, like, it's something with a long neck. That's confusing to me. Um, the other thing I read about <laughs> July... <laughs> There's like a dust storm heading for the United States. Did you see that today? Uh, yeah, from the Sahara. <laughs> from right? the Sahara. So it went all the way around the world, and then to if, us. To us. So and not here. not from what it would it be? Not from east to west, but from west to east mm-hmm. in the U.S. Took the long way. This home. dust storm is coming to us. So that's we're gonna be breathing what's in, new. Breathing in some Sahara. At this point, nothing surprises me in the news cycle. So I just expect dust storms and Plague, Loch Ness monsters, frogs. Hamilton's Ooh, coming out on Disney storms. Plus. Ah, Hamilton. Yeah, I'm we like about that. that. We like that show. Top five show for me. One of my favorites. Yeah, it's a good one. So that's something to look forward to. Yeah, less than the dust storm. We have a shining bright star on the horizon. Lin Manuel Miranda. There we go. What about you? Do you have any news? I uh, no, no. We're just mostly uh, we're getting ready for our road trip. We talked about last time. Um, packing up, getting some good audiobooks in the queue, mm-hmm. and some other podcasts, podcasts and audiobooks and other educational materials because we like mm-hmm. to learn mm-hmm. all the time. Or just bad pop radio. Or that. There's always that. Participating in the culture in yet another way. <laughs> Participating. Stamp of approval. Do you all want right. to move on? Yeah. What are, what are we talking about this week? This week, we are talking about Montessori schools. Montessori schools. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I've heard of these. Neither of us attended one. No, we didn't. Which I think is important to no. mention. <laughs> well, we're going to talk a little bit about our personal experiences because you... I worked at one. Worked at one. A daycare. And my preschool, based on my recollection of it, which is admittedly quite cloudy because I was so wee, yeah. um, is that it might have been influenced by Montessori principles. Well, and we talked to one of our mutual friends who used to work at that right daycare in college yeah she said, that, said they, that it wasn't well she said they weren't explicitly adhering to they weren't like you know an accredited mm-hmm. montessori institution or anything like that but that they were kind of inspired by the yeah. ideals of it so we'll talk about that more when we get there but so we both have some experiences with yeah. montessori but not in the sort of formal way that we're going to get into mm-hmm. so where does this come from the montessori methodology okay. let me tell you about this if you've heard about a Montessori school or about uh, Maria Montessori, she was a doctor, so I should probably call her Dr. Montessori, but Maria. Our friend Maria. <laughs> it, you might know them because of their famous glass classrooms. And so the glass classrooms were three sides, like planes of glass and then like a regular wall. And it was a way for people to observe and study the kids who are participating in the class. Yeah. And this is why I'm convinced that I was secretly in a Montessori pre-K classroom because there was a one-way glass mirror, one-way mirror yeah. on one of the walls and it freaked me out when and I That's one of the it. things that Montessori is known for is yeah. this glass classroom. Um, so basically it starts with Maria Montessori and she's born in August of 1870 and she lives in Italy. Okay. So this goes back a ways. This yeah, isn't I'm that new. it way back. Okay. I'm throwing yeah. it way back. <laughs> way, way back. You're doing the history this week. I'm that's trying to. Usually my job. I know. I feel like I need to do a better job. No, I'm so. excited. For it. <laughs> 
So Maria Montessori's dad was a financial manager and her mom was actually well-schooled at the time, which really wasn't all that uh, common. For women. Um, yeah, for women. So she was uh, supported avid education and she was a big reader. And so we see a lot of that love of education coming from Maria's mother. Yeah, not a stereotypical Italian woman no, in not this time period. And not like a normal Italian family in that way either yeah. to like support their daughter. So Maria originally wants to be an engineer. And at 13, she is going to attend an all-boys technical institute. So she's like paving the way. That's That would yeah. be so scary. I'm so impressed by her. Yeah, that's really cool. So she starts as an engineer and then decides instead that she's going to be a doctor. So in 1896, she graduates from medical school and a lot of the information I read said that they believe, uh, many people have actually said that she was the first female medical school graduate in Italy, but that's not true. She was one of the first. Gotcha. But as far as they can tell. Maybe a sort of famous first. Yeah, or yeah, yeah. And I think she's probably remembered because she did become so well known at the time. Mm-hmm. So in medical school, she actually focused on psychiatry. And so then from there, after that, she started attending classes on pedagogy. And that's how she started immersing herself in educational theory. So it started by way of psychiatry instead, which is kind of an interesting way into education, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that. That's a sort of developmentally informed approach. And that explains everything about Montessori, I think. If you just know that about her, then to look at what it becomes, it's like, well, of course mm-hmm. she was, because... There's a lot of uh, interesting educational theory that comes out of Italy during this time period. Uh, Maria Montessori is just kind of one figure, but there's... Just because of the political situation in Italy yeah. around this time, mm. there are all kinds of interesting uh, sort of liberatory-focused educational pedagogies yeah. and theories that, that emerge so she's she's got her own take but there's there's we'll probably explore that some other episode mm-hmm. but there's a lot of interesting stuff coming out of italy at this time all the time yeah. but yes especially this time. yeah i mean pasta red wine i mean end it there and i'm happy pedagogy <laughs> i mean okay that's my life so pasta red wine and pedagogy <laughs> the end. i need that on my t-shirt yep. um Okay, so Dr. Montessori actually was really interested to begin with in teaching children with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And so that's kind of where this starts. So in 1907, she accepts a a challenge, as they called it, in all of the reading to open a full day child care center. And it, this location was in a poor inner city district of Rome. Uh, did somebody like throw down a gauntlet? Like, who, yes, who and she her? accepted it. <laughs> was it the city? Well, or? it's because these people were underserved youngsters mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. they were like troubled, according to all of the, you know, other people who didn't live there. Girl, as it gotcha, goes. Gotcha. Yeah. So um, a lot of these little guys, these girls, <laughs> little guys, <laughs> little guys and girls, all oh, the little guys and girls. Hmm. Uh, so they were all underserved. <laughs> I was trying to find a way to not just keep saying kids over and over, and it came out little guys, and that's even little weirder. <laughs> and little girls. Okay. So the students are all underserved, and they're in between the ages of three and seven. And so their parents go to work, and they're left basically with nothing. Maria created this center. It was the first of its kind, and it was super successful. So even though at first the kids were pretty unruly, they showed a lot of interest in doing puzzles and learning to uh, prepare meals and manipulating learning materials that she had designed. So she was creating things for them to keep them busy. Which is, it's so hard to create things. Oh my gosh, for kids, three to seven. Especially for kids that young. Yeah, I just, I love people who work with pedagogy and instructional instructional materials at that age because it would just be so it would be so hard for me like three to seven year olds i would have such a hard time yeah what do i so she's taking the like (laughs) that psych experience though Uh with her uh into it and so as she's watching them grow from their surroundings that's what she is using to help them teach themselves if that makes sense so she's observing the ways that they're learning and then she's using that to manipulate whatever these materials are that she's using so Using the scientific observations and experiences gained from her earlier work with these kids, she started designing learning materials, and she built a classroom environment that fostered a kid's natural desire to learn and also supported them with the freedom to choose how they wanted to do it, how they wanted to accomplish it. So she would, it was basically the idea of, this is what I want you to achieve, and you need to work it out on your own. So it's self-guided learning. Mm Mm-hmm. That's sort of a core tenet of Montessori right. pedagogy. A lot of people didn't actually believe it was that effective, but these children were thriving. 
So her methods began to attract the attention of prominent educators, journalists, and public figures. And so by 1910, there were Montessori schools all throughout Western Europe and around the world, and including in the United States, where the first one opened in New York in 1911. Maria has a really, Dr. Montessori, she has a really interesting life. She spends her time writing books, writing articles, lecturing, preparing teachers, developing the program, doing all of that to support her style of learning. So she comes to America, she speaks to all kinds of people, and she's she's really taking it on herself. You and I mean, like, she is the one saying, I have learned what I think is a great way to teach students, and I want to teach you exactly how I've done it. And so she actually goes out and teaches, you know, future educators to do the kinds of things that she did in her classroom. Dr. Montessori was like no stranger to issues and things like that. Like she was constantly evolving and she was a very outspoken feminist. And so as part of these like world and political things that were happening around her, like it encourages her at one point to add peace education into her curriculum. But then in 1940, she had been traveling to India and the hostility between Italy and Great Britain broke out and she was forced to live in exile for the remainder of the war there. So the entire time she was there, she was just training teachers to teach the Montessori method to students. But in exile. Yes. Wow. Because she was like, well, it might have, you know, this is what she does. Might this is what well, she's built for. Might as well be useful while So, I'm here. yeah. And so, I mean, 1940, we're talking, she was born in 1870. Mm-hmm. So she's 70 years old. Mm-hmm. And she's exiled and teaching. Like, that's my dream, mm-hmm. I think. Probably not exile, but that's really cool. Well, regardless, all of these things are sort of what's set up, you know, what we now know today as Montessori education. And so at the end of the war, she returned to Europe. She lived her last final years in Amsterdam, and she died May 6, 1952. Hmm. Wow. So, but she is the creator of all the things that we now know as mm-hmm. Montessori. Yeah, and it did get imported to America. Uh, when? How did that happen and when? And So they first come to America in 1911. And so unlike in Italy, when she was doing this in Italy to start with, it was for the poor and underprivileged students. But in America, of course, of course, America got a hold of it and was like, it's for upper class families, wealthy, cultured. Okay, this is what we want to use. Mm-hmm. And so as soon as America got a hold of it, that those were the students who had priority right. to it. They're like, ah, a tasty foreign import. Yes, mm. we'll give our rich kids this. It's still the, it's, uh, there's some criticisms <laughs> that it's still that way a little bit. It is. We'll talk um, about that. But. but I love that Dr. Montessori's heart of it isn't there. You know what I mean? Like she was looking to help kids who didn't have help. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's what makes it, yeah, what, her, of... what makes her so interesting to me is that these are the kids that she was like, they don't have anyone. Uh-huh. And so I will provide them. A lot of my favorite sort of educational theories sometimes somehow get co-opted by the, mm-hmm. the, the elite. It's weird. Yeah. Because, uh, I mean, the founder, one of the founders of my college started by teaching factory workers on the Lower East Side. Mm. And not, now it's the not core that. of one of the most expensive liberal arts colleges around. I mean, they cut their tuition recently, but, you know, it's Still. it becomes the foundation of an expensive liberal arts degree. So it's, you know, it's discouraging to see these methods that really are existing to open up opportunities to all students being sort of co-opted. Yeah. But, um, yeah, anyway, go ahead. Well, Maria, like, she knows, obviously, 1911, that um, the schools are starting to pop up in New York in other places in the United States. So in 1913, she actually comes to America and she lectures up and down the East Coast. And for the most part, she found that the schools that were saying that they were using the Montessori method, she was actually pretty pleased with them and she considered them to be a great success. And so actually that trip in 1913 went so well that she returned in 1915 to teach potential teachers herself. And so by 1916, there were more than 100 Montessori schools operating in the U.S. Man, she's really well-traveled for oh, a woman everywhere. Yes. She's all over the world. Yes. And so, um, but what kind of happens in the 1920s, though, is because of the war and all kinds of other things that the U.S. and other countries have going on at the time, there are very few practitioners left who are still using Montessori. And this is also about the time that we start to see a lot of other experts, as they call themselves, speak up and against Montessori and her teachings. This is after World War One. One. Yes. So there are obviously some Political motivations, yeah, we've war got some problems. Mo- motivations, mm-hmm. all kinds of 
strange. So there's a pretty great decline in the Montessori schools, right? So right. they were really, and they they were only here for about ten years before it started to dip off. But then in the 1950s, they actually come back and they make a resurgence. It comes back in the 50s. Yeah. So there's a woman whose name is Nancy Rombosch, and she has come across the readings of Montessori. And she actually attended a Montessori Congress in Paris in 1953. And this was after Dr. Montessori's death. Mm -hmm. So this teacher, Nancy, um, while she's there, she meets Mario Montessori, who is Maria's son. Gotcha. And so Mario um, encourages and helps Nancy to lead the way in the U.S. again, sort of as a resurgence of um, the Montessori method and practices. And so the Washington Post designated Nancy, this the teacher who had gone over and kind of restarted it, as, quote, the educator who is responsible for renewing this nation's interest in the Montes- Montessori method of education. And the Catholic reporter called her the lady who started it all. And Newsweek referred to her as the red-haired dynamo of the Montessori revival. <laughs> I love this lady. <laughs> She's so cool. Um, I want to be the red-haired dynamo. I know. Same. Something revival. So, yeah. So, <laughs> the, all of these quotes come from a, a book by uh, Phyllis Pavel, um, which I'll include in the notes. But the, that's where those quotes came from about her. But this Nancy woman, with the help of Mario Montessori, uh, Dr. Montessori's son, kind of led the way, as I said, to bring back the Montessori method in schools in the United States. And in 1960, the American Montessori Society was established. And in the U.S. alone, there's approximately 5,000 Montessori schools that now serve over a million children, all the way from infancy through adolescence. And there are thousands more still in existence worldwide. So this resurgence, at least for America, really stuck with Nancy Rombosch. Mm -hmm. And then um, we also obviously see that it's still a very successful schooling. Yeah. In other countries as well. I went to college with a pretty good-sized population of Montessori students, students who went to Montessori mm-hmm. schools, either in kind of elementary or even high school, some of them. We'll talk about why that is, because my college is very much focused on a sort of self-directed learning approach, which is kind of at the core of Montessori. Mm-hmm. But yeah... That's interesting. So it took hold the second time, sort of. Yeah, and there are tons of famous people who attended Montessori schools. Um, I read that George Clooney had attended one. Steph Curry, who plays basketball for the Golden State Warriors. Julia Child, Jeff Bezos, Taylor Swift, Beyonce. You said the the founders of Google, Larry Page and Sergey Brin. Yeah, uh, Jimmy Wales, who founded one of the founders of Wikipedia. Wow. Oh. Jackie Kennedy Onassis, Prince William and Prince Harry. And actually, Princess Diana worked at a Montessori school before she married Prince Charles. And wow. so she was, uh, Princess Diana was very into a, she a, a teacher? big, um, I can't remember if she was a teacher then. She as it was at least like an aide in the class or huh, something like that. But she was one of, um, one of her big things while she was living was education support and reform uh-huh. and things like that. So it was no surprise that her sons went there mm-hmm. and Anne Frank attended one as well. Wow. Interesting. So we're talking all kinds of people. All kinds of skills. Mm -hmm. Um, And many of them, like I was reading a little bit about Steph Curry, and he said that he really believes that uh, a lot of his success is because of that. And it's just because he had to figure it out on his own. Mm -hmm. So there seems to be some some merit there. Yeah. So the self-directed nature of Montessori pedagogy is kind of probably its central tenet, I guess. We'll just talk a little bit about the sort of core components of Montessori education. So as far as teacher training goes, there are several accrediting institutions. It's the American Montessori Society here. There are a couple other ones for international accreditation. But there's this kind of core body of Montessori accrediting institutions that take care of all of that. And it is because it's such a specific program, you kind of you got to go and get a specific accreditation Mm -hmm. to teach in Montessori schools. The way they tend to look, uh, mixed age classrooms are a big thing for Montessori schools. So you get these age ranges that I think are pretty interesting. And yeah. Again, they're kind of informed by this approach to developmental psychology um, and psychiatry, like what Maria Montessori is interested in. So she groups ages together. So we got like infants to 18 months old for the really young ones, um, toddlers, toddlers maybe 15 months to three years old. Um, we got early childhood, two and a half to six years old. Lower elementary, six to nine. Upper elementary is nine to 12, some, somewhere around there, or maybe six to 12. And then the secondary, you got age groups of 12 to 15, 15 to 18-ish, something along those lines. So, you know, in a typical high school, that's 
that's going to combine maybe your freshman class with your seniors. Mm-hmm. Um, so, which does happen occasionally. In yeah, high yeah. school anyways. Some so courses that, in high school on that the happens. upper ends, it's not as surprising, I guess. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But I think the those lower, like the the six to nine and the nine to twelve, those are probably really great opportunities for kids to kind of build some some yeah. skills. There are some interesting developments that happen on average during those age ranges that make that mixed you know age range approach kind of interesting because you've got puberty happening in there sort of there's some really uh, you know interesting opportunities also some interesting challenges that are unique to that kind of approach but that's how Montessori uh, decides to handle mixing age groups so Montessori teaching materials there's this sort of distinctive approach. F- they follow a logic, a logical developmentally appropriate progression allows a kid to develop an ad- abstract understanding of a concept. So this is a sort of a key thing. Montessori, they're not necessarily, it's not, there's not so much a focus on rote memorization or um, not even necessarily teaching from a textbook. It's sort of just like, wi- <sighs> it's hard to it's sort of hard to explain unless you're doing it but it's just it's less directed it's much less directed so it gives an opportunity for kids to form their own opinions and ideas about concepts being presented yeah Yeah. being presented in the classroom rather than sort of receiving that instruction from a teacher they get there on their own paths and it's delivered in a way that forces them to have to work together yeah like that's the goal yeah that you together can figure it out yeah um so sort of like you're saying, it's it's very much student-directed work, and it's even kind of, you even see that sort of child-directed learning in the classroom layout. So they're kind of interesting, you might call it like an open floor plan type <laughs> of thing. They're, they're, uh, classrooms, Montessori <laughs> classrooms tend to encourage freedom of movement around and sort of freedom of exploration. And it's kind of, even the, even the physical surroundings of a Montessori classroom are intentionally designed to... Uh, make it so that teachers can kind of guide kids on their own learning paths but the kids themselves have the opportunity to make those paths and choose those paths there's a big focus on sort of respect and order and productivity this is one of the other reasons that i think my my uh pre-k classroom might have been oriented toward that there was all these you know there was a cleanup song that everybody would sing and we put everything back in its little station and there were stations around the room but there was kind of a big open space and we would walk around and just kind of go from station to station and doing different sorts of activities and being creative there's a lot of creativity focus in a Montessori education so anyway Montessori schools also tend to use non-traditional grading systems sometimes this can give kids a little bit of an issue with college applications but there's some there's usually some sort of easy translation between whatever grading system a particular Montessori school is using and the more typical ones accepted by colleges and universities but they they're not so much an obsessed with a gpa and a grade scale and points and you know checking boxes that way so they're more non-traditional more interesting probably more qualitative assessments than quantitative ones in Montessori schools. And then another thing that's sort of important is uninterrupted work periods. The length of these will kind of vary for the different age groupings that we talked about, but two or three hour work cycles, we want to have just sort of uninterrupted focused work for a sort of minimum of maybe like two hours for the most part for the different age groups, you know, in each kind of core curricular subject or something like that. But the idea is, okay, now we're working. Now we're not distracted by other things. This is a time we have set aside to do this thing and we're going No to interruptions. Work. Right, right. So Montessori schools, at least in the United States, are a little bit expensive. We found some examples in Ohio here that the tuition for these places would range from 7,000 to 11,000 for 10 months of schooling for, for this is for a pre-k through eighth grade mm-hmm. example and some kids like pre-k and like those like the four and five like some of them will go year round so mm-hmm. i mm-hmm. think that could be also something to consider yeah they are expensive though they're all owned and in, owned independently uh, so cost and financial aid will vary pretty drastically by school and by locale and things like that but 
you can use vouchers like we've talked about school voucher programs uh voucher programs education savings accounts are an option but it is kind of a state-by-state basis uh in terms of the cost of these things so if you're interested in sending your kid to a montessori school you could probably anticipate at least eight thousand a year Mm -hmm. in tuition costs there's one note uh, but a lot of montessori schools will make known about uh special needs and IEP identified kids usually they say something like if their needs aren't being met at a public school um, and the cost of attending would be covered by the home district that that child was attending because of their lack of providing an adequate learning environment for them so it can be an, a sort of non-traditional option for certain students who need yeah, a different kind of learning it seems that that's approach. kind of common as well for identified students especially that a Montessori school might be a more um adequate learning environment yeah. for them than a normal public Montessori school. or other kinds of non-traditional learning environments tend to be a haven for certain kinds of students who need different kind of classroom attention. And the stuff that I found for Ohio, it was most of, almost all of the schools were like pre-K through eight. Yeah. I, I tend to see less of this at the high school level. Yeah. For sure. And I actually, in my research, I could only find one Montessori high school. I'm sure there are more, but this is the one that I found. And their enrollment were about was about 86 students. And it said that they had 16 teachers on staff. So we're talking about very, small. very small. Yeah. 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 And, and like I said, I'm sure there's more, but I would say probably 90% of the information based on like price and everything is on pre-K through eight, because that seems to be where the majority of the, the Montessori activity, you know, mm-hmm. is mm-hmm. happening, I guess. So, yeah. I, I do hear a lot of Montessori kind of like daycare inspiration and Montessori yeah. lower grade education focused stuff. It is it is less prevalent in it the seems secondary that, education circles, I think. Yeah, sorry. Uh, it seemed that some of the students who had gone like through eighth grade that then would normally go to some sort of a private school a high mm-hmm. school to finish mm-hmm. out nine through 12 yeah so that seems to be a pretty typical sort of you know what I mean, bridge or whatever yeah as far right. as what would be next yeah just because there aren't nearly as many high schools as there are uh, lower and middle mm-hmm. there are some criticisms of the montessori methodology that i think are interesting and worth talking about one that gets leveraged a bit is that <laughs> The approach, there's a, there's a high valuing of independence in a Montessori method. If you leave it up to a student to determine their own learning path, that can kind of cause some social and emotional isolation from one's peers if taken to an extreme or maybe not done quite right, given a, you know any student's particular needs. This is sort of similar to, I don't know if you've heard of Waldorf schools or Steiner education. It's kind of a similar educational philosophy it comes out of... Um, it comes from this guy named Rudolf Steiner, a European educator who's kind of um, focused on, you know, intellectual, artistic, and practical skills integrated in a holistic manner. And then we sort of creativity and imagination is a focus. So like you see the same sorts of criticisms leveraged at Waldorf schools as those at Montessori. So Montessori, Montessori schools tend to teach you to think on your own, which is great, but they might not focus so much on, you know, a team oriented approach. Hmm. What we talked about earlier was that there are points where you're prompted to work together in Montessori yeah. education. So I think maybe this is kind of on a case by case basis in some in some ways. Oh, but sure. um but I can see where it would be valid to wonder whether a in a highly independent, uh, highly self sufficient educational environment might not always be the best depending on the student for teaching a kind of modern workforce team oriented collaborative Mm -hmm. that's a fair attitude i guess another thing that happens sometimes is that the fact that montessori schools tend to be more open-ended in their approach to classroom instruction can cause problems for some sorts of students there's some students who might be intimidated by a looser curriculum sometimes kids just need more structure Mm -hmm. i agree with that there are that's one thing that i would agree with about montessori as far as uh, there are just there are students who just need rigid this this you know right there are some students for others they need montessori so yeah yeah yeah. i think that that's fair i just i just think that it's maybe not necessarily a one-size-fits-all kind of education i agree there are students who simply for whatever reason need more structure more pointed directions Mm -hmm. more less hey, here's an idea, go figure some things out. And more like, this is our lesson plan for today. And I'm sure that evolves by age too, but... For sure, for sure. Some kids definitely need that. 
I do think it is kind of interesting though that the the approach from a position of sort of psychiatry as a background that changes it would result <laughs> in an education that might not work for everyone. You know, it's just kind of an interesting friction there. I think that this it is a very opinionated kind of pedagogy, which means that it's not going to trap everybody in one mm-hmm. one bucket, basically. Mm-hmm. And then the other thing which we talked about just with the tuition is that it's right now Montessori is not very accessible to Mm -hmm. a lot of people because of its expense so even that fact means that there's going to be a kind of homogeneity of the student population at a Montessori school they're going to be overwhelmingly upper middle class and white yes (laughs) so almost exclusively I don't know if that's true of your experience of Montessori schools but that is um a sort of unfortunate side effect of the fact that tuition cost is pretty significant yeah yeah. It's expensive. Yeah. And a lot of families can't afford to. Mm-hmm. Yep. As with any kind of private education. But yeah. I, I would like, and maybe if I get another chance in professional development, um, sometimes we're allowed during PD days to go and visit a school. And I think it'd be really interesting to maybe find one that I could go and visit for a day mm-hmm. and just kind of see what it looks like. Yeah, I'd love to observe too. I want to know a little more about what this kind of nebulous concept of self-directed mm-hmm. learning looks like. I mean... It's easy to talk about. Yeah. Ah, yes, we're empowering our students to find their own way or grasp at abstract concepts mm. through their own paths or yeah. things like that. But I would, I would love to know a little more about what that looks like, really in practice. So if we, if we're well, reaching any Montessori teachers out there, let us know. We'd love to come visit you at your schools. So. Well, student-led learning is a big push, anyways, mm-hmm. and that's one of the biggest things that I've seen in the last ten years of education is this push for that. So. I think my dad would maybe joke that this is another one of those times that it's the same thing with a new name. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so Mm -hmm. maybe this is part of that cycle. But uh, I do try to incorporate as much student learning as I can just to kind of, you know, let them use their own resources to to get where they need to be. And that's that that's what feels like um, is the heart of what Dr. Montessori was going for. So I I definitely agree that's not for every kid because I see kids in my own classroom struggle with that part. I think the another part of that that I Another reason that I would like to see it happening in practice is that often with these student-led approaches, the the sort of criticism or the back and forth about it is about rigor. <laughs> we get a lot of us, even by, I mean, my experience of my college gets the same way because it's so student-directed. And because the grading systems are non-traditional in places like this, people often question whether what's happening the rigor (laughs) is up to standards of other places sure Um, whether students are being best served by this or whether they're kind of just wandering around doing whatever they want Mm -hmm. maybe in a way that is not so helpful for their educational development but i personally i'm a big fan of student directed learning but like we talked about it does come with caveats it's not Mm -hmm. necessarily the best situation for every learner yeah so and it takes a lot on the teacher's side as well because as a teacher you have to be willing to accept the seven ways your kids might get there while in your head this is the proper more reason you know like that's one of those things yeah. as a teacher you kind of have to be prepared for if you open yourself up to that you have to be more comfortable with gray areas. yeah exactly like you have to be like well you got there i'm not so sure about this part but mm-hmm. <laughs> and that might be a part of montessori teacher training it might sure. be focused on being more comfortable with yeah. nebulous reasoning or goals or learning paths or whatever you want to call it. Um, my, part of that might just be becoming comfortable with no right answers or sort of right See, answers. That's just it. Or I think there's no right, really, no wrong right answer, way to get there. Right. Wrong answer, but interesting path to getting yeah. there or you know, some variation on that theme. Yeah. Again, we don't we don't personally have experience with Montessori teacher training uh, too much. We learned about it at my grad school, but yeah. experience, but not not any firsthand knowledge of that Mm-mm. teacher training. I've program. never uh, been to a school or anything like that, so I can't. Your say. Montessori teacher, please write in. Let us come watch you in your classroom. Yeah. Tell us everything about it because we're fascinated. Yeah, we are. So, okay, we're ready to move on to uh, fill in the blank. Yes. So last week's fill in the blank, uh, the question was this. The Gregorian calendar is the one most commonly used. It is what gives us 365 days in the year and allows for a leap year every four years. The Gregorian calendar was named for blank, the man who introduced it in October of 1582. Who was it named for? Pope Gregory the 13th. 
Pope Gregory the Thirteenth. Yeah, I Great almost job. gave away too you, many clues. You were trying to give away a title and a number and everything. I wanted to, <laughs> unless you got exactly correct, Pope Gregory the Thirteenth. <laughs> eh. You okay. lose. So this week's, go ahead. Yeah, this week, fill in the blank. This famous inventor, along with his wife, established the Montessori Education Association in 1913 and established the first Montessori class in Canada. So send us your answer. Yeah, this one blew my mind a little bit. I'm excited about you this made me, one. You made me check it. I just You couldn't... scared me into thinking I had done some bad research. No, it's just so interesting. It is. It's really interesting. Yeah. So. Yeah. So anything uh, else about Montessori you want to toss in? No, no. Okay. I think I'm about wrapped it up. It's really fascinating. I would love to see it in practice. I think critics of it probably aren't as in touch with the real strength of that kind of learning. It, yeah. You have to really be immersed in it in a way that you've kind of already consumed the Kool-Aid mm-hmm. as it were to, <laughs> to be a really Easy strong advocate advocate for it. But I do, I do think that criticisms of these kinds of pedagogies often come from a point of not having very much experience with their power. So, I mean, you know, not having very much firsthand experience with Montessori, I still think that it probably is a real haven for a certain kind of student yeah, at least. And I think that there would be teachers, I can think of a few that would just be incredible with that kind of work, you know. And so I think just like students, there are teachers better fit for it than others as well. Mm-hmm. And so I think that would be an important part of it. The summer that I spent working at a Montessori daycare, I loved it so much. Mm-hmm. I was a sub, so I was never in any one class and we had assigned teachers in every class. So I just filled in wherever they needed me, but it was definitely very, the kids owned what they did. Mm -hmm. So if there was a mess, they cleaned it up. Mm -hmm. They picked it up. That's nice. But I think it's important to learn that kind of stuff because it also gave them, you know, they had no problem coming up and being like, I dropped this, you know, like, and so they kind of owned it in a way that not a lot of younger kids do in my experience. Clean yeah. up everybody but, everywhere. But I enjoyed it a lot. And right. it was a really neat experience. And so the teachers would prepare some really cool activities and kind of show them, like, this is what I want you to make. Here are the supplies. Mm-hmm. And then we would, you know, they would put themselves in their own groups and go from there. So I really, I really did enjoy it. But I also went into that summer thinking I wanted to teach elementary education. And after day one, I came home and I was like, I'm going to be a high school English <laughs> teacher. <laughs> So I learned very quickly what was not it's for, a, you know. <laughs> it's a tough age group. Yeah. <laughs> it's exhausting. It requires so much energy. It does. I've never had that amount of energy in my life. So even not even when I was that age. Did a great I have experience. That much energy. But that uh, age range is not for me. Yeah. Yep. It's a tough one. Okay. So uh, what did we what did we learn this week? Would you like to go first? Yeah, I I talked about this website earlier. It's an app as well. It's called Schoology. Mm-hmm. I talked about it during the quarantine episode right, right. where we kind of just went through some yeah. ed tech stuff. Yeah, right. So I am using it this summer as part of professional development that's being uh, socially distanced because I cannot travel to the place where it was supposed to be held. Mm-hmm. And so I'd never actually used Schoology. I just was in that episode. I was talking based on what I knew of it and what my coworkers had talked about it. But I'm learning to use it and I'm really enjoying it. It's a bit of a a shift from Google Classroom. I will say I'm very comfortable in Google Classroom and that feels like home. But I'm enjoying the, the chance to learn about this and to see if this might fit some of my classes a little bit better. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's been a good thing to kind of force myself to learn because otherwise I probably wouldn't have really, you know, gone around and piddled around on the site or anything like that. But it's been, it's been good to learn. So I feel at least now that, you know, I'm a little bit more well-versed. So. Cool. Interesting. I remember you you talking about that and some of your colleagues like that one. Yeah. I have quite a few colleagues who use it. It's a lot more involved than Google Classroom. Is this the one that's like the Facebook Facebook, for teaching kind of? Yeah. Yeah, that's how it's always like marketed whenever I hear about it. But it is. And the interface looks like it, like the website, all of it. So, yeah, if that kind of, you know, makes it easier for me maybe to work Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm because I'm a little bit familiar with the setup. But anyways, so I I, I am enjoying Schoology and uh, I think it would be a a great classroom management system for some teachers. So, yeah, what about you? We spend a lot of time talking about video games on this podcast. It's not intentional, but it's just a great way to unwind and relax for us so we play a lot of them and watch streams of them and stuff like that but one of my favorite games of all time is minecraft and minecraft actually gets used in some interesting educational ways and there are even you know whole servers set up that schools use you can minecraft is sort of an open world building based game 
so you can actually do things like set up circuits and computers and somebody built a calculator out of blocks in this world and it's really fascinating just the kind of and you can also recreate real world places in it and explore them and do all kinds of fun and weird things um it's a really just sort of completely open-ended thing that kids can learn with so we like minecraft for educational reasons but we also like it just for fun reasons and a good um, escape <laughs> yeah and mojang which is the company that it's actually owned by microsoft now which another bummer all of our favorite things keep getting acquired by the big bad guys but <laughs> um but uh, the company that makes it came out with a new thing called minecraft dungeons which is just sort of a fun dungeon crawler game and we've been playing that this week and it's a lot of fun and it's another oh, it's so nice it's just another good way to unwind we play it together so it's social and it's just like yeah you know it's not very high stress and if you mm -hmm. just need a way to kind of wind down at the end of the day yeah it's a it's not a adrenaline crushing kind of game it's mm. kind of fun and the graphics are fun and yeah it's just a nice way to kind of wind down so it's a new it's a new experience new minecraft world minecraft dungeons yeah and i will say i was telling chelsea that like the world just feels heavy like that's always the phrase i use when it feels overwhelming or sad or whatever it is and so it's been really important for us to find things that uh you know bring us joy and keep us busy and so for us it's been video games and projects and the yard and all kinds of stuff mm -hmm. so like if you're one of those people like 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 the world just feels heavy like you you need to find ways to kind of help release that yeah that's productive and healthy for you yeah, whatever that's... that might be if it's cooking if it's reading right. you know whatever we do chelsea loves to cook and so we do a little bit of everything now that the weather's nice we can be mm -hmm. in the pool and that's something that you know so i think for adults especially i just want to give people permission to enjoy yourselves and yeah. have fun and do something that maybe doesn't have a point yeah. sometimes <laughs> you know as we talk about the kind of image that gaming and esports have mm -hmm. it's you know associated with laziness or whatever sometimes yeah. but i think it's important to kind of open back up some of those experiences to adults who need to just chill out and escape yeah. from the heaviness of the world like you're talking about for a even minute. if it's just games on your phone yep. like i can crush candy crushing like sometimes mm -hmm. like i just really get into it so anyways i guess moral of the story is this the world is heavy and it is hard to navigate the news cycle and twitter and the entire internet sometimes and so just make sure that you're finding things that, you know, give you a little bit of escape. Take your mind off of it. Give yourself a break. Go forth and have a good time. Talk to you next time. See ya. See ya. Hey, listeners. Thanks for supporting 16 to 1. We're trying to grow our audience, so please check us out at 16to1.com, all spelled out, and tell your friends about the show. On our website, you can find links to follow us on social media, an archive of all our old episodes, and a contact form where you can get in touch. Thanks again for listening, and we'll catch you next show. Oh no. Oh, Dio.